Hello, Julia. Here we are for part two of our conversation about nature and circle dancing. And um, in the first conversation, you were telling us all about your love of circle dance and your early connection with the natural world. And today we're going to go back a bit to see where that love of nature first came from, which was Wales. So, Julia. (laughs) Not the animals, the place. (laughs) Wales. Yeah, Cardiff in Wales. (laughs) Thank you. It's lovely to be talking again about this. And yes, I originally come from Cardiff in Wales, which is part of the United Kingdom. So when I think about nature, it's it's part of us. We are part of nature. Nature simply means what is natural. And everything in the world is natural, except perhaps what humans have done building on top of nature, altering things, changing habitats, and that sort of thing. But it's all around us. And when I was a very young child, probably four or five years old, I really began to forge a connection, I think mostly with the plant kingdom, but also with the animals. And I lived in a city, it's a sizable city, of about half a million people, something like that. And so the idea of going out into the countryside and experiencing nature was not something that we were able to do very much. But I found the natural world all around me. And I was particularly interested in what I call wildflowers, which most other people call weeds. And I found them growing at the bottom of the trees that, that lined the streets in Cardiff. I found them in the corners of the parks. And really, you can see, if you want to get philosophical about it, you can see the whole of nature of creation by contemplating a blade of grass, because a blade of grass is as much of a miracle as a blue whale, if we can come back to whales. Mm. And uh, for people who are not aware of the British Isles, Wales is a particularly rural, I know you said you um, grew up in a city, but the area of Wales it, compared to the rest of the country is, or the rest of the British Isles rather, um, in, well, England, um, is very, very rural. It's got mountains, it's got valleys, green grass, um, compared to further east, maybe, where it's more built up in England. So um, in a way, I'm quite surprised that that hearing you say that Cardiff you didn't get the chance to go out so much into into the wildness because in my mind that whole area is very wild and um uninhabited compared to a lot of well, the it's a socioeconomic remark um really to say that we didn't go out into the wild it, it wasn't um we couldn't afford to go off on trips um so it was the, the way we lived right we lived. right this is back in the 50s and 60s and uh we didn't so much go off. We did go to the seaside sometimes, and of course that's part of the wild nature too, and um, the the shells and the seaweed is fascinating. I'm afraid I'm a bit of a compulsive taxonomist, and what that means is I like to know the names of things, and that started very early, so I started learning names of things, and You don't have to know the name of something to appreciate it or love it or see its beauty, but I've always found that it helps me in particular if I can identify what something is and uh, understand how it interacts with the other things around it. I find that really fascinating because there, because my love of nature, because we were going to see the difference Mm. and the commonalities, but I was thinking before we spoke what was one of the key things I would say, and it would be, I don't need to, I don't know the names of anything. (laughs) And then you're, so it's wonderful how different, you know, everybody experiences their experience, however they do. And that's absolutely unique. And there's no right or wrong way. Because I haven't a clue what flower is what, but I still, still enjoy being in the wild. Absolutely. And, you know, all our brains are wired differently. Even our hearts are wired differently, Mm. I think, sometimes. And the things that appeal to one person don't necessarily appeal to another. And uh, that's true with movement arts Mm. and 
with movement practices that the sort of movement practices that we're talking about in this program for the relief of trauma things that help people connect with their inner selves and also with the outer world and the outer world of nature well what have i just said i mean it is part of us it, it's nature is both the inner and the outer world at the same time mm. and i think that as you just said that coherence between all parts I mean, of you just state. imagine dancing in nature that yeah out among the fields um we're very fortunate where i live that i have a fairly large backyard back garden if you would call it in britain um with trees and we're able to dance out there from april through november the rest of the year it is too cold to be outside dancing but we're able to dance as the grass greens as the little flowers begin to come up as the trees come into leaf as the trees come into flower so they drop their flowers on us uh, and it is it really adds a great dimension to the circle dancing mm. to be able to do it outdoors and and at night as well do you do it under the moon yes we do sometimes with a nice campfire to dance around lovely it's beautiful lovely yes and the um as you said, the seasons are so important, as you were saying in the, the first um, interview, the rhythms of the season um, and the circle dances, which can weave into like the celebrations and the, 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 the ancient goddess cultures, which used to recognise the harvest and the, the rhythms of, of the natural world. And that weaves into that as well, doesn't it? Yes, the circle of the dance is intrinsically connected with the circle of the year and so is human society and um, we may not realize it but a lot of the festivals that we celebrate are actually based on the astrological astronomical year sorry <laughs> the astronomical year and um even if we call it something different you'll find that most cultures tend to have a celebration at a particular time of year, like when spring begins, if you like. Mm. And they may call it Ramadan or they may call it Easter or they may have other names for it, but it's actually humanity celebrating the spring, mm. rebirth, uh, that it comes around and it comes around. And of course, this is very Northern hemispheric centered because much of the population of the world has lived in the Northern Hemisphere, and that's where quite a lot of these ideas have been developed. So when I lead dances on Zoom, if I lead spring dances, I have to bear in mind that for my Australian people who are tuning in, it's not spring it's at all. <laughs> and maybe the dances that I'm dancing are very inappropriate. So I do really want to mention the Southern Hemisphere and that things are different there. And we don't, we don't uh, need to think that what we do here in the Northern Hemisphere goes for the mm. whole world it's not Th things are different they're on a different cycle <laughs> exactly i remember when i was in australia in the 80s um coming up to christmas and it was like it was so weird for me to consider christmas being in the blazing heat of the sun <laughs> yes yes so if i can talk about what we do in the Northern Hemisphere, because that's what I do, and that's the culture that I'm coming from. We do have dances which celebrate the different times of the year. So right at the moment, we're talking at the moment in April. So I'm thinking very much about spring dances and perhaps about the May Day dances that we'll be doing uh, in a week or so. And then we have dances that are more appropriate for summer. They may celebrate the height of summer or they may celebrate the sun. We, we talked, when we talked about circle dances, about how they create mandalas on the mm. ground. If you were to look at them from above, you'd see the pattern. There are several sun dances that create round suns and rays going in and out of them so that you feel as if you're dancing the sun. And these connect us as we go through the year doing the dances that we feel appropriate to the time of year, they connect us and help us to focus on what's going on in the world, in the natural world. They're also 
familiar. It's lovely when you come back around to the winter solstice and I find it lovely anyway, to, and to be doing the dances that I do at no other time of year, but that I've been doing for maybe 20 years at this particular time of year. So it creates a wonderful familiarity with the cycle of the year. Mm -hmm. And um, the dance, as we said, was, was, is one part of your life very much, but you've also um, worked in the nature reserves. And are you still doing that? The... Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I'm, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a seasonal ranger in national and state parks. And yes, I am still doing that. And that's been an absolute privilege to work in some of the national parks here in the USA and actually to live in the parks so that I'm there at all hours. But the National Park Service consists of well over 400 different sites all over the United States and in some of its overseas possessions um, or dependencies, whatever they call them these days. And they're not all huge wild areas like the Yellowstones and the Yosemites that people know about. There are historic sites as well. So if you were to liken it to the UK, a lot of the sites that are within the National Park Service are the sort of sites that are in the National Trust in the UK. Mm. So there are historic houses. The smallest national park property in the country is one small house in Philadelphia where a particular Revolutionary War hero lived. So, But it's still part of the National mm. Park Service. So when I've worked in different national parks, I've worked in some of the big ones. I've worked in Death Valley. <laughs> which is an amazing place. And I've worked in Joshua Tree National Park, which is in Southern California in the desert there. But I've also worked in a smaller National Historical Park in Vermont, which is called Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historical Park, which is all about the, the history of the conservation movement in the United States and consists of a Victorian mansion, well, pre-Victorian originally, but in its current iteration, it's a Victorian mansion and 550 acres of woodland. So I've worked with both cultural and natural history. And the natural history that's preserved by the larger national parks, and even within the ones that are historic sites, the Park Service will take pains to make sure that it preserves any natural areas that are there as well, is is very, very wonderful. And it's a great privilege to work and be among these beautiful places. Mm, it must be uh, wonderful to be surrounded by the, the vastness compared to here, where you can't go far at all without bumping into somebody and you can never find any silence. Whereas I imagine you can find the silence in those national parks. Yes, you can. If you get off the beaten track a bit, you can find silence and you can also find beautiful night skies away from the light pollution that is prevalent around cities and settlements. Experience of nature, Venetia, I've seen some beautiful videos that you make that take us into nature on your doorstep, if you like. Yes, that's the, um, the tame wild. And that idea came to me during lockdown because I was on a um, neighbour's uh, social media site where the local community swap information about plumbers and things. <laughs> and um, there were so many people who were just so stressed and anxious during lockdown that um, I thought that I would just do these little videos to help relieve people's anxiety and stress about the um, situation we were all in. So I went out and I've been in an area in the east of England, Suffolk, which is very flat. It's quite, uh, you can't really go far without bumping into people. But during lockdown, for once, there was um, silence in the woods and things. So I took my um, recorder and recorded the bird song and the nightingales and things. Um, and just made little walk, little walks. But the idea was I'm very um, attracted to the idea of awe walks, 
which are different from um, stride outs, as I call them. I, I have stride outs and or walks. <laughs> stride outs is getting rid of stress and um, uh, getting your heart going and much more physical. Um, then there's forest bathing, which is more contem you know, to contemplate the feeling of the woodland, say, and um, the sights, the sounds, the smells, getting in touch with the embodiment and the physicality of getting out of our heads, getting out of technology and really grounding and being in the presence of nature. And then there's all walks, which I had read about, where... Um, it's to foster a feeling of awe, which is quite difficult. Um, you know, people think of awe being, as you're saying, like in the Grand Canyon, where you couldn't fail to feel moved by the vastness and the um, the awe, awesomeness of, of, of it. Whereas in England, it's much more subtle. You have to look for little subtle things like the smell of moss or um, it's the spider's web glinting in the in the morning light, that kind of thing. And so I just filmed these little bits of um, things I found and put them together in little videos and called them or walks. And I just did them for the local community, really, just as a de-stressor. And then when lockdown finished, I decided to keep doing them just because I thought they were fun. <laughs> but um, I read also in you know the psychology there was um some research where they um took people um on the test with elderly people um and disabled people and people um suffering from mental health issues and they um took them into nature and some of them they did the all walks and they gave them a journal and they were given a cam well they used their camera to take selfies and then the other group just did an ordinary walk and they noticed that those who did the all walks they noticed um that they started to feel much more compassion to the people around them and the situations they were finding themselves in and they also noticed over a period of six weeks that at the beginning people took a selfie with themselves as the dominant thing yes here I am and here is the background the, the scenery but the more they got into the nature the feeling and the communication even if it was subtle the awe they noticed that the scenery became the more dominant factor and themselves in the selfie reduced so as their um, practice of the awe walks continued their sense of worrying about themselves in, inwardly diminished and their gratitude and awe and sense of wonder became more rekindled and I thought that was a really interesting uh, for those who like the science <laughs> it was an interesting um, thing to look at yes that's a wonderful insight and I love the idea of focusing and um, to go back to your all walks at the beginning there to to of focusing on a single item like the moss or perhaps a tree mm. in britain there are fantastic trees there are so many wonderful old trees lining the, the roads that you could spend a long time contemplating a tree and and slowing down your own pace to that of a tree mm. it's a beautiful exercise mm. it's, think, um... it's you know what, what you're talking about with people becoming closer to nature and finding that it helps them it it certainly helps me um the act of walking whether it's a fast walk or a slow walk if you're able to walk of course um, the act of walking is something that's very, very deeply important to human beings. It's one of the things that, uh, it, it, well, it's important. And when I really feel stressed, I do find that getting out and walking, and especially walking somewhere 
with natural surroundings is really, I'm, you know, I don't measure it, but I'm sure it brings down my blood pressure and, mm. you know, everything just chills out, if you like. It's also very beautiful to walk around neighborhoods and look at the flowers <laughs> in people's gardens because people you can see what a connection people have I mean gardening is, is a, another whole question and a, another whole therapeutic uh, practice but to see what people do the results of what people do in their gardens is also very very beautiful mm, mm. Uh, and so many um children now don't necessarily have the access to um, being or playing in the wild as they used to, which I think also can set up more stress and things later on. I noticed the other day, um, there were very few children because I, I couldn't hear them playing in the back gardens. I thought this is really weird because it used to be a time when everybody was, all the children were playing outside and um this connection with nature again I was in in a school which had woods and um as young children we used to play in the break time in this wood and play dens and sweep up the um, pine needles to make little timber cooking and use the pine cones for food and make-believe and that um those early years of being in the, the little wood as it was called still I think was like the, mm. the beginning, um, you know, I just, just smell the pine wood and I'm immediately back as a five-year-old playing in the woods. <laughs> That's beautiful. And you're right, you don't necessarily need a large grand landscape. No, yes. A small place that you can escape to or a, a beautiful bed of flowers or a beautiful tree can feed your soul. In the way that nature has and in the way that nature does for us. Mm, I think it's so important now, isn't it, with so much technology. I mean, part of me, when I did the um, Tame the tame Wild or walks, was the fact that they were virtual. And I thought, mm, uh, you know, but yeah. even for people who can't get out because of disabilities or whatever other reason, just looking at calming images of trees, flowing water, that can still evoke those feelings as well for those who can't actually get out. What I love about the videos that you've made, I mean, number one, the quality is very good, but you you get out of the way. It's There's not a narration, it's the walk, and there's actually very little of the human voice in it. Mm. And it's really, as you say, gives people an opportunity to connect with the natural footpath, the river, the trees, without anything intervening in between them and it <laughs> except i suppose the technology but we can all suspend our disbelief yes yes and uh, would you uh, different people tend to like different elements so in your life do you some people prefer mountains i myself are a sea person is there a particular element which is resonates with you more well, I would start talking about one and then think about another. So I would say <laughs> many of them. <laughs> I certainly love going up to the tops of mountains or the tops of hills. I, I just love the experience of, of feeling free, feeling like mm. a bird, as, as if you could just take off and also seeing the view down below. Uh, that's very wonderful. I love the, the sea, as you say. And the deep woods are very, very beautiful. And there's really a special place in my heart for the deserts of the southwestern United States. And these are not deserts. You don't, don't imagine deserts like the Sahara, which are nothing but sand. Mm. Someone will probably tell me that the Sahara isn't nothing but sand. <laughs> <coughs> no, these, these are deserts which do have quite a lot of plants and animals in them, but they have very, very low rainfall. And the plants and animals are adapted to live in these situations. And those are magical places, absolutely magical to see how creatures survive mm. and grows and flourishes there. I saw a photograph somebody posted the other day from, I think it was California, after some rains where all these flowers, which had been the seeds dorm dormant, so it looks like desert, then suddenly, almost overnight, it, carpets and carpets of beautiful colour 
Yes, absolutely. That's a real phenomenon in the desert. And when I was a national park ranger, I was a seasonal ranger, which means it is a temporary job. And the parks recruit temporary rangers to be there when they need extra help because there are going to be a lot of tourists and a lot of visitors. And of course, a lot of visitors come at the peak times. So it mean, meant that I was always working in a park at the best time of year for the park. And the carpets of wildflowers were spectacular. It, it varies from year to year because it depends on rainfall, not just in the spring, but in the previous mm -hmm. autumn in order for, for the seeds to germinate and put down their roots. And then when you get the spring rain, they put on the growth above ground and up they come. And it was just amazing for me. It was a peak experience to have a job <laughs> that <laughs> sent me out into fields of wildflowers. Um, in, in your work as a ranger, I'm wondering, have you ever kind of um, enjoyed a dance which was not part of the curriculum, either with a group, but something, you know, you just saw the wonder of the mountain or you saw that you had some space to yourself and you just thought, ah, oh, I just need to dance. And there may be a particular dance you may have, you know, feel called to do in wonderful places. It does, has that ever happened? <laughs> well, that brings up some lovely memories and not so much while I was working as a ranger, um, although sometimes when I was on my own, I would break into a little bit of a dance or something. And I remember, oh, I've just remembered this one, when a friend bought some land in New Hampshire and he took me out to show me this new piece of land that he had just bought. And he was a circle dancing friend. And we walked up in snowshoes up to the top of the mountain. And then we did a circle dance that we knew in snowshoes on the top of the mountain. It, it was not very elegant, but it just <laughs> felt so connected and so beautiful. And it, we, the step that we did was a, a very old traditional step. So I do dance in wild places when I can. And personally, I have a practice which is known as the Cherokee Dance of Life, which I, I'm not a Cherokee and I have learned it from people who have learned it from people of the Cherokee tribe. And it exists in many different ways. And I do it, as I've learned it, with great respect, because what it does is it honors the four directions, which is something that happens a lot in circle dancing. Mm. And it pulls in the energy of the four directions. And this is a very beautiful chant with movements that go with it that can be done anywhere. But I find myself doing, when I find myself awestruck, in a place of beauty, perhaps on a beach, perhaps at the side of a river, but very often on top of a mountain. And I just think this is a beautiful, beautiful place. And I honor it with this practice. And because I've been doing this practice so long now, when I do it on the top of a mountain, it brings back to me a memory of doing this practice in all the beautiful places that I've done it. Maybe not all at once, but as, as I'm working through the practice, honoring the four directions and weaving their energies together, I get pictures of when I was standing on, on, a, on a hillside in Greece, on, when I was standing on a beach in England, when I was on top of a mountain in Vermont. And it unites the whole world of nature with the world of movement and and. Consciousness and intention, mm. that's what it brings together for me. Mm. So it doesn't matter to have an exact practice or you can invent your own practice or you can use any kind of practice. I can imagine doing um, Tai Chi movements on the top of a mountain. I think that the familiarity of repeating movements actually moves us into a space that reminds us of how we felt when we've done those movements in other places. And it's mm -hmm. very, very beautiful. This is really similar to what I was saying about repeating dances at certain times of year. The familiarity of the circle of the year, of coming back to the stories, the poetry, the dances that belong to the different times of year, 
is something that really unites us as a community and which grounds us very, very strongly in our planet. Mm. Uh, could you, um, you said doing the dance, you're bringing in, you're honouring the four directions and you said you were bringing in the energy of the four directions. Could you explain exactly what that means? Because there might be people who think what does bringing in the energy of the four directions mean? <laughs> well, my understanding is that the to honour, to experience the completeness of the energy of the earth we can look to the four directions, north, south, east, and west. And they each have different qualities. The north is considered to be um, a place of the intellect, uh, a, a place where decisions can be made, a place of clarity. So north and the south is a place of the heart, of the warmth, uh, the west is you have the beauty of the sunset and the idea of moving out into the world. And the east is the beginning of all things. That's where the sun comes up in the morning. And all these different energies can be woven together, almost like ribbons, like strands, to create a, a whole. People sometimes talk about the up and the down directions as well. And we can also consider the inner direction, which pulls all of these energies in together. Okay. Thank you. And that weaves the full circle. Mm. And where have you done this um, dance? I know you said you've done it in different places, but... Um... Well, I remember doing it in the grounds of a stately home in England. One time I was wandering around their woods there and I found myself in an open place that just spoke to me. So I felt, right, this is, you know, it just comes. I, I mean, I don't, in between experiences, I don't even think about it very much, but it just pops up. It, it's like, wow, this is a, a beautiful, special place that I'd like to honour. So I also have done it on the tops of hills in many different places. So is it like a circle dance or is it like more like a Tai Chi movement? It's more like a Tai Chi movement. Mm -hmm. So you can do it on your own then? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I see. Okay. Great. Well, anything else you'd like to share about how nature has woven her I mystery think, into your circle dancing? We, we talked about in one of our pauses, Venetia, was that sometimes people are a little hesitant oh, yeah. to go out into places by themselves and that's very understandable we, we you know we all have had different experiences and we all have different levels of uh, anxiety about mm -hmm. our surroundings so I do want to really come back perhaps we're coming full circle here in the conversation to say that Nature is in us and all around us, and we don't have to go out down a secluded footpath or we don't have to go to the top of a mountain when there's, where there's nobody else. We can experience and, and love and connect with nature, even when we're in a crowd of people. Mm. And there are natural places to be explored within cities. There are places where people can feel very safe. And so I would want to encourage and suggest to people if they haven't already that they find all the places it's really funny I mean I've lived in several different cities and towns in my life and there always seem to be little parks or little areas that are not as well known as other places mm. and so it can be quite an experience to get a list of all the parks in your area and go around and explore those and connect with the nature of these oases in mm. South areas. Um, before I came to talk to you, I was in, in the garden and um, I was moving a um, paving stone. And I picked it up and underneath there was this amazing um, intricate dance of ants. And they were, <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh, I can't disturb you and um, I'll get my, 
I'm going to record if they're still there. I'm going to I'll record them because they were they they'd made like little not like an ordinary nest nest. It was compressed down, and they'd got the uh, these little roots, Galleries. and it looked and it almost looked like a looked like a castle with all the different moats and things around it. And they were all busying around, and I picked so I put them carefully down. And I picked up another one. And I realised that their community had gone underneath that one as well. So I don't know how far back they go, but I thought all this is happening just under this bit of old um, paving stone and this amazing, amazing wow. <laughs> so as you're saying, you haven't got to go to the huge big vistas, which is why I was so um, wanted to focus on the tame wild, the tame, because the, the tame being in England, we're so built up. We often have to just go to um, parks and things, but also the tame being how we can tame the wild mind by being in nature. So it's a, it's a play of words, the tame wild in England and taming the wild mind in order to feel that peace and tranquility and stability, which is always there behind the busyness. Like the That's ants. a beautiful note to conclude on, I think. <laughs> well thank you julia for chatting to me again and being persevering through the glitches we had <laughs> thanks to zoom <laughs> well thank you i've really enjoyed it it's been a great opportunity and i've learned a lot myself great thank you julia bye <laughs>